Good evening. Happy Lunar New Year and welcome to Buddhism as Lived Experience monthly lecture series <coughs> with Dr. Louis Lancaster and jointly organized by Department of Religious Study and Religious Granted Council and sponsored by Institute of Institute for the Study of Humanistic Buddhism, University of West. I'm Meryl Sake, Chair of Department of Religious Study. So before we begin, I would like to request our President of the University of West, Dr. Min Hua Ta, to say a few words. Thank you, Professor Sakya. Okay. Good evening, everyone. This is wonderful to uh, see many of you again at Zoom. Um, and thank you, Dr. Lancaster, for offering us the opportunity to learn and to gather. Uh, and I would like to wish everyone a happy year of the ox. Um, the ox signifies strength and resiliency. Um, so as the Grand Master Venerable Xin Yun stated, no matter how difficult the situation, as long as there is compassion and wisdom, his wishes is for everyone to cultivate a heart that bl blooms in all season. With that, I believe we shall overcome all the challenges in front of us. May the new year bring you strength, good health, and happiness. Thank you. Thank you, President Ta. Today, it, it is a great honor to welcome and introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Dr. Lancaster. Louis Lancaster. And Dr. Lancaster is Emeritus Professor of the Department of East Asian Languages at the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of West. Last month, uh, Dr. Lancaster gave a wonderful talk on emptiness. And today, Professor Lancaster is going to talk about giving, the purity of purpose. So giving and our dana regarded as one of the most important Buddhist virtue. And giving and giving our dana is the ground of compassion. And it is a prerequisite to the realization of liberation. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Lancaster. Thank you very much, uh, President Ta and uh, Maroj. Thanks also to Chris Johnson for helping make this work and for Venerable D coming to help us during our uh, last part of, of today. Great pleasure to be with all of you. I wish you also a happy new year for the year of the ox. Let's hope it's a good year for us all. <clears throat> One of the great acts of giving was, was when the Buddha gave his first teaching to five wandering ascetics in Sarnath. It was at that moment that what we call Buddhism came into existence. That teaching was a gift that would result in a movement spanning thousands of years and influencing millions of people. So, what was the dynamics of the giving and receiving at that event in Sarnat? On the day of this gift, the Buddha, still emaciated from his practice of austerities and constant fasting, faced the audience of five who were hostile and rejecting. It appears that the wanderers in the Ganges Basin often joined with a small group of others to search for teachers who could lead them to liberation. If any one of them happened to find such a teacher, they would go back to their group and share the views. This is probably what the Buddha was doing when he gave his first gift of teaching. He had left the five some months before to go to the sacred area known as Gaya. Well, he didn't find a teacher, but achieved liberation through his own efforts, which set him apart from those who believed it was necessary to have a teacher. At the same time, while in Gaia, 
He had begun to eat and bathe. And the five ascetics saw this as a retreat from the path of liberation. His compatriots of the past pledged to ignore him and agreed not to greet him or honor him. However, as he approached, they could not help giving him recognition as the power of his presence swept over them. Standing once more before them, the Buddha first assured them that liberation and enlightenment could be attained without torturing their bodies. But this was not the main message of his gift. Having asserted the validity of what he had done, he spoke of the first great insight about the reality of existence. Now, his preparation for this moment of giving had been long and some of it arduous. His final journey before the awakening had taken him to Gaia, where people had for centuries come in pilgrimage to be in contact with ancestors and to perform <clears throat> rituals that would release the ancestors from ties to birth and death cycles. One of the features of the place was the presence of huge banyan trees. They were seen in themselves to be objects of veneration. Shakyamuni sat down under one of these great trees and vowed to meditate there until he had achieved the goal of separation from birth and death. During the night before he achieved his purpose, he experienced a range of overwhelming visions. Sitting at the site where the spirits of the ancestors were said to reside, he saw his own life history of being reborn and dying and being reborn and dying over thousands of years. Not only did he have a vision of his life cycles, but he envisioned the same for millions of people, for all of the spirits of the dead gathered in that place. These experiences and visions were followed by a trance state that was filled with the blissful ease of an enlightened being. Well, after that, he left Gaia and returned north to Sarnat for the reunion with his former seekers. And it was to this group that he first shared his insights. One of the messages of this story is to say that before giving a gift, it is important to be fully aware of the significance of it for yourself. It's so tempting to fall into the pattern of describing an ideal when we ourselves have limited knowledge of its significance. The details of the meditation practice and the content of the resulting visions and feelings experienced by Shakyamuni at Gaya indicate that the early Buddhist accepted that he had achieved an enlightened state before he uttered any of the words of his first public teachings. Giving a gift requires preparation and insight. In Sarnath, the time came for the gift that launched Buddhism as a movement, that is one with followers, teachings, and a way of life. The gift the message that the Buddha gave that day must surely have been a surprise. From one who had reached the deepest level of human thought and perception, the five ascetics undoubtedly expected to hear of glorious visions and blinding moments of assessing the power of the cosmos. Instead, his first gift was a simple sentence. There is anguish. There is suffering. 
there is dissatisfaction. Rather than the magnificent of cosmic forces, his gift related directly to human experience. There is anguish. From there, he went on to give the second truth. The second statement of the way things are as viewed from the perspective of one who has seen reality. Anguish experienced by all the beings caught in an endless cycle of birth and death is caused by a lack of understanding the true nature of life. Some call it ignorance, but to me it seems to have been more like mistaking reality. Mistaking that there are things that are unchanging and that our person is long lasting. This mistaking means that when we have illness, old age and death, we suffer anguish because we expected something different. I think every old person will tell you that the speed with which the experience of aging takes place is a shock. You can't help thinking, surely life is not this short. My grandmother at the age of 90 admitted to me that she had always assumed if she lived to be 90, she would be fully ready to face the end of her life. However, on her 90th birthday, she was not ready for life to be over and it surprised her. She admitted that even at 90, it felt too soon. There is anguish when we mistake reality. Thus the first sentence of the teaching of the Buddha was a recognition of one of life's most basic experiences. He went on to complete his gift to the five ascetics by assuring them there is a way to have access to reality and to understand the constant changing element in which we live. And once there is this insight, we're ready to go forward and have a way of life that is filled with wisdom and compassion. Anguish, in fact, is one of life's most effective teachers. In Buddhism, there is a definition or a description of what's called the perfection of giving. A perfected act of giving is when one does not have the concept of one who is giving or one who is receiving or the existence of a gift. Well, what can that possibly mean? If these three are removed from experience, it would seem that the act of giving is impossible. However, the text repeats in many place, places that even though the Buddha or the Bodhisattvas do not have such concepts, nevertheless, they still give. They still say the words. For the Buddha or Bodhisattvas, the great gift is the teaching. So is it that if one is to perfect the gift of teaching, one has to give up any concept of a teacher, a pupil, or a teaching? All of this sounds paradoxical and it's easy to turn our backs on such demanding ideas. I've chosen to give this lecture on the theme that would seem to say, if I'm doing it perfectly, I, I do the lecture with no idea of myself as a teacher, of you as hearers, or the words as meaningful. Now the perfection of wisdom text also cautions that we should all always teach in such a fashion that it does not leave the hearers upset, regretting they ever decided to listen confused, so they start giving thought to the teaching. 
Well, you can see I am like work cut out for me in this lecture. Having taught continually for 55 years, you might think <clears throat> that I should have practiced long enough to be a proficient. For some years, I've known something that I don't often say out loud. That is the most important thing is learning, much more important than teaching. But learning is on the part of the hearer, not the speaker. At Berkeley, there was a major research project done with how people learn and retain what they have learned. I followed the project with interest and it was completed the year before I retired. It's too bad, too late to help me. As I read the final results, I had, <laughs> I had to face the fact <clears throat> that my method of lecturing had been probably the least effective teaching technique. After a 45 minute lecture, about 20% was still remembered five hours later. And after two weeks, not more than two to 5%. But if the lecture was stopped and discussion occurred, any student who asked a question still remembered their own question six months later. So I came to see that the person who learns the most retains the information for the longest period of time is uh, the so-called teacher. So if you want to learn, my recommendation to you is get a group to listen to you and start teaching. And what you say will stay with you. I hesitate to admit this, that I have received a salary for decades when I was mostly teaching myself. Through the decades, having contact with thousands of students, I have often had people approach me, usually in airports, and say, I took your course 25 years ago. And it's not unusual for them to go on to admit that they can't remember the content of the course, but they've never forgotten taking it. The people in the airports are reporting on their memories that were personal to them. While forgetting my words, they have held on to something that they learned by thinking about ideas. And the remnants of those days is long lasting because it was their experience, not my words, that left the impression. So how is it possible to be in a situation where one learns where there's no concept of a teacher, a listener, or spoken words. I have mentioned in the past lectures visiting and teaching in maximum security prisons. It was an eye opener for me. I think that on my first trip to the remote desert areas with Danny and Shirley Tam where these prisons are located I thought to go as an accomplished teacher with much to share. However, entering the prison was to remove myself from all my experience. I entered a no hostage area, which meant if an inmate tried to escape using me as a hostage, the guards would shoot to prevent it. Going through the entrance procedures, I felt that I was being initiated into a realm where nothing was under my control. Nothing was familiar. Nothing was as I imagined. From that first group of men that I met, I understood that this experience was not just teaching something to someone who needed it. From the very first greeting, I started to learn. Sitting in, in the room with 20 men, some who had been there for decades, 
who were stripped of all possessions, all status, all the things that I had left behind for the time being at the prison gate. I knew I could not do my usual round of lecturing. There was no place for such a teacher in that room. From the first comments of the men, I came to see how much I had to learn. The learning took place not so much by our teaching, but our whole encounter and environment those men taught me so much, not by being teachers, giving their gift to it, students, rather just being present with one another in the, that room was the powerful gift to us all. I, I think we could have just sat silently and let the significance of the event wash over us and much would be learned. They were so glad to have someone come to see them. And to my surprise, I was so glad to have the feeling of honest communication where none of us was in control. Not one of us was the teacher. Not one of us was just a student. And not one of us had the dominant important words to say. <clears throat> Excuse me. Chris, my screen is blocked. Thank you. And yet, prisoners and myself spoke, and we learned, and we communicated much that was wordless. For, for perhaps the first time in my career, I had discarded the mantle of the expert, the one with all the knowledge one who could give the right words. How could I have right words for those who had experienced something so different from my life? The inmates had their own words. And the impact of those words on me was enormous. Every time I have an opportunity to return to a prison, I am engulfed with the feeling of being in a special space, a special frame of mind. I can in those instances understand how important it is for me to develop the ability to receive without being limited by any of my preconceived ideas of givers and receivers and gifts. There is a skill in perfecting giving and receiving, a skill that we should all master before acting. A few years ago, I was walking along a street in Berkeley with an acquaintance who had come to visit over coffee. On our way, we passed a homeless man with a worn cap on the ground in front of him begging. My friend stopped took out a $5 bill and went over to him and put it in his cap. And then she said to him, can I ask you to do something for me? I've had a sorrow in my life. Would you say a prayer for me tonight? The man sat upright his face seemed to glow, and he said, yes, yes, I will. I will do it tonight. 
tears came in her eyes and she said, I appreciate it. Who was the giver? Who was the receiver? What was the gift? Now I can tell you that as an elderly man who worked slowly with the cane and then even then unstable on my feet, there are times when I need help. But not everyone knows how to give it to me and leave me with my dignity intact. Sometimes well-meaning people do something for me and say, there you are, young man, or even here, honey, let me do that. Well, I can live with that. But in truth, it makes me feel that I'm seen as senile, and childish, weak, not equal in strength or capacity. That is the dark side of giving. When one feels superior, stronger, better educated, more prosperous, smarter, the gift degrades the receiver. How is it possible to give in this perfect way of no giver, receiver, or gift? On the surface, it, it would seem to be impossible. But if we give consideration to the problem, it begins to seem less strange. For example, if I decide to give food to the poor and the needy, how can I do so with purity of purpose? If my giving is done with the attitude that I am better off than the poor and the needy, that I can do something for them that they need, what will be the result? It's not the case that poor people need food, housing, medical care, and clothing because they're poor. They, like me, need food and shelter because they're human beings. They're just part of the human race. We all need these things. Is it possible to give food to somebody simply because they are like me and need to eat? There's no shame in eating. They're not lesser because they require all the things that everyone requires. One of the hardest things in the world is to, to do good, <laughs> to be helpful without shaming or blaming. When the Buddha found his old companions and gave them the first truth, there is anguish. He didn't say, you have anguish. He simply stated that it exists. He gave a gift with compassion that did not set the fight apart as failures compared to his accomplishment. Now, I, I apologize to you for playing the role of teacher and seemingly giving you a gift of my words. Rather, let me thank you for what you're doing. I thank you because you've given me your time while I spoke. And as I spoke, I learned. As I said just now, the real learner in the classroom is the teacher. As I've been talking <clears throat> in this lecture, I've heard the words in a form that I will long remember. So in this setting that we are in, who is the teacher? Who is the student? What has been given? Well, if teaching is difficult to understand in terms of purity of purpose, it's easier than being a parent. Can I, as a parent, give to my child without the concept of, I am your father, I am your mother, you are my son, you are my daughter, you must listen to my words 
of advice and obey my instruction. If there is a situation fraught with anguish, it is that of parenting. As the years go by, we look back and we have regrets. Did I do enough? Did I do too much? Was I too demanding? Was I too lenient? I recently had the experience of witnessing a mother give her gift to a two-year-old. The father had confessed to me that the two-year-old boy had become defiant and having, alert, having learned the word no and the power of that word couldn't stop saying it on every occasion. So when his mother had told the child that it was time to go, he said, no. And she calmly said, yes, we must go. He began to wail and lay down on the floor and sobbed out words of defiance. His mother sat down beside him and said, I'll wait until you are finished. And she sat silently looking off into space. Well, it was not long before he stopped the tantrum and crawled into her lap. She hugged him and started to talk about what they would be seeing and doing when they left. I was amazed at how skillful she was to be firm, but permitting the boy to make some decisions. I felt I'd learn much more than the two-year-old. How can we raise our children? So they learn as early as possible that they can make decisions. That we're partners with them in the process of their growing up. They, not, they may not remember the parental words, but they will long remember the moments. And our influence may be strongest when it's wordless. I must mention that most of us have the memory of some adult in our childhood who paid attention to us. It's important to a, for a child to know that there are friends outside their immediate family who care for them. When I was 10 years old, I was taken to visit a friend of my parents in a city some miles away. A hostess was a very kind woman. She took me for a walk to see exciting things like a paper wasp nest. After returning home, I was encouraged to write her a thank you note. To my utter delight, she answered with a letter to me, my very first letter. Fired with enthusiasm, I wanted to write back, and I did. Although a letter every two or three days was considered to be excessive, so I only had permission to write once a month. Well, the first month I wrote every day on my letter and had a manuscript that I handed to be sent to my friend. It was a blow to only be allowed two pages per letter. But that dear woman answered every letter for some years. She gave me something I could not get at home a person out there in the world who knew that I existed and interacted with me. Now, I don't know what it meant to her, but for me, it meant a lot to my self-esteem and my security about reaching out to others. Children need such attention, such gifts such friends. 
As I mentioned, when I visited prisons, I learned a great deal. One of the things I came to realize was that in one moment, one can function as a teacher with meaningful words, but in the next moment, we can become a student. The prisoners voiced their own words, and when they spoke those words, they were truly teaching me. Words can be meaningful in one instance and meaningless in another. I have repeated the question in this talk, who is the giver? Who is the receiver? What is the gift? The answer is we all have the potential to be givers, teachers, parents, and under certain other, certain other circumstances be receivers, students, children. Words can be meaningful in some cases and meaningless in another. At times, just by giving, teaching with purity of purpose, we become learners and our own words become meaningful to us. When we hear words from others, our role changes and we become the receivers. If we receive with purity, then words or gifts become meaningful. It takes as much effort to be a good listener as it does to be a good teacher. Giving a gift with a purity of purpose, with full understanding of the realities of the situation is demanding. It demands that we let go of the ego, let go of pride and let go of arrogance and let go of mistaking reality. But when it's done in the right way, no one is superior. No one is inferior. Even though as I speak these words to my, into my computer, and we're only together virtually, I hope we can all look at the many faces on the screen and understand that we are brothers and sisters in terms of anguish. And our compassion can go out to ourselves and all the others. We can give each other a gift that is pure just by being together, just by recognizing there is anguish within ourselves. What a wonderful gift to see each other and to recognize that being in company with one another we create an experience that will be felt long after the words are forgotten. We are in every moment a teacher, a hearer, and we experience the meaningful words of our own thoughts. If we no longer mistake reality, we can have a perfect moment of givingness all of us teaching, hearing, learning with deep appreciation for the importance of everyone around us. I hope we can all reach a point where giving is receiving and receiving is giving. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lou, uh, for your outstanding and insightful talk. It's very touching. Of among all give, giving, uh, Dhamma giving is the best. Uh, we all have been benefiting from your act of giving of Dhamma teaching, Dhamma dana. We much appreciate it. Uh, here begins our question and session. So please write your questions in the chat box. Uh, so first question I want to ask, uh, in 
Uh, there's one controversial topic of self immolation of Buddhist monks. Lu, can you hear me? Uh, self immolation of Buddhist monk. Do you consider it as an act of giving for the sake of Buddhist community? Well, of course, the most famous example of this in modern times was the famous monk who set fire to himself in the downtown Ho Chi Minh City during the Vietnamese War. What was remarkable about that is to watch the video and realize that he was on fire, but he sat there holding his mudra of his meditation. And he did that for a long time. Other people tried to emulate him. There were copycats. People started burning themselves. But they were in agony. They screamed in agony. They weren't ready to give that gift. To give such a gift as that has to be in, you have to be so prepared that you can sit there as that famous monk did and hold your mudra. I think it's a very good example of how important it is to make sure you're giving your gifts or I'm giving my gifts when we're fully prepared and fully capable of giving that gift. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Uh, there's one question uh, from Venable Joe from Australia. How would you interpret uh, the merit of giving in modern times? Say it one more time. How would you interpret, interpret, interpret the merit of giving in modern time? <clears throat> well, I think the merit that from pure giving is not just a modern thing. <laughs> It's been with us a long time. As long as people have been giving, it's, it's been there. I think that we, in, in, but in our modern times, I, I do feel that we so often give our gifts, say, to the needy, and do it in such an awkward fashion that we shame them. It hurts me when I see a line of people standing outside a church to go in and have lunch. I know they need lunch and I want them to have lunch. But do they have to be on display? Everybody who drives by knows those are needy people. Those are people who have to stand in line to get something to eat. It's shame, it's shaming. We don't mean to shame them, but we do. I feel that we must, with great care, learn how to give to people, not just to the needy, but we learn, need to learn how to give to our children and we know need to learn how to do our teaching, and we need to, to learn how to give to our elders. And we need to realize that if we can get rid of the, the idea, I am doing something wonderful for somebody who really needs it. 
if I can get rid of that concept and, and it's like I said with food, the very idea that the homeless need food because they're homeless is, is incredible. They need food because they're humans. They're just like me. I get hungry. I need food. If I share my food with someone else, I'm sharing, if I can share it by saying, we're in this together. I'm just like you. I need to eat. I, I worked for a while <clears throat> with the homeless group in the county in which I live. And I, I quit because I felt we were shaming them. We could never get enough people to help make the bags of groceries to hand out. And yet here were 30 or 40 people standing there. And I said one day, well, why don't we let these people come and do this on their own? No, no, we can't do that. We must help them. And yet, and yet when, when you allow, it's like the woman with the beggar, when she allowed the person who was begging to be her equal. When she said, I need something because I'm a human too. I have sorrows. You can do something for me. I felt that she gave that man a gift that was far beyond that $5 bill. She gave him purpose. She said, you're important. I need your help. Will you do this for me? It's hard to, to reach such a state where we can actually do that in our giving. But when it works, when our giving is receiving, <laughs> as I say, when I recognize that when I'm so-called teaching you, the big issue is I'm learning. I'm the receiver here. I don't know which one of us is the teacher. I don't know who's getting the most from. I don't know what's happening to these words. I don't know what's going to be remembered. I don't know any of that. But we are together here in this strange new world of a virtual reality. Here we all are, our faces on the screen. You give by being here. We give by listening. We give by asking. We give by sharing. Thanks. Next question uh, from one. When our capacity and effort are very limited before giving, we make judgments first, then select the person or a group to receive our giving. Does or does not this kind of judgmental giving meet the purity of purpose? Need the what at the end? Uh, does or does not this kind of judgmental giving meet the purity of purpose? <laughs> Um, well, I, <clears throat> I'm not sure that I'm going to answer this question in, in, in the right way, but I, 
of course, part of it is, is our purpose in giving, our purpose in receiving. Uh, I've had to learn how to receive in a better way. Uh, I, in the past, I didn't know how to receive often. And I, I think sometimes I hurt people because I didn't know how to receive what they were giving me. I either felt mm, I don't deserve this or I don't know what to do with it or I struggle. But I realize now um, fully receiving a gift and, and letting people know that I have fully received it is the best thing I can do. Like with parenting, if your parents are still alive, uh, do you know how to give to them? Do they know how to give to you? Do we know how to forgive each other? Is forgiveness sometimes the greatest gift? But it can't be made up. You can't just think, oh, I should be good. I should do this because that's what being good is. That'll never work. I can tell you that. You have to be, we have to always be totally involved in the moment and understand our role in that moment and allow that role to play out. Probably didn't answer the question. <laughs> Go ahead. Maybe ask me another one. <clears throat> Another question. Uh, there is the saying of how women give the gift of life. This concept can be problematic as it makes sense of when women die in the childbirth. And a way to perhaps say women give this gift so that all the way women are discriminated against can be dismissed. What are your thoughts on that Western concept of how women give the gift of life? The gift of life, let's, let's think about the gift of life for a moment. Who gave me my life? My mother, my father. They both gave me life. My karma. Of being in a certain place at a certain time. But the gift of life 
doesn't mean that somehow I am given something and then I'm through. I agree with you that we do discriminate. We discriminate against women. We discriminate against aging. We discriminate against all kinds of problems that are presented before us. And we discriminate, of course. How do we stop doing that? It's not by saying suddenly to a woman, I'm going to, to not discriminate against you. <laughs> but just in saying that in a way, I'm already discriminating against her because I'm not partnering with her. I'm telling her what I'm going to do for her because she needs it and she's being discriminated against. Isn't it time? Isn't it time in our society to say we're equals? We all have anguish. And that none of us is superior and none of us is inferior. We've got to prepare ourselves by getting rid of those kinds of distinctions. I have two wonderful granddaughters. And I see that, and they're half Japanese. And I see that they're sometimes discriminated against. And I see that people look at them or make comments. And you know, there's a part of me that wants to protect them and to defend them against all of this. And I realized they really don't need that. They need for me just to stay there beside them, just to be in the moment, to feel my love, to feel my support. And that I feel they're strong. They can, they can handle this. They can do it. And, and I don't want to make them feel weak. Here, little girls, let me help you do something you can't do. I don't want to do that to them. I do not want to do that to them. Well, I'll tell you, being parenting, I'll give you a hint here. It is just as hard to raise a boy as it is to raise a girl. They're both demanding. They demand of us to understand that gender and to give it its value and to say, I understand what is needed, or I'm going to be here just to help you as you struggle with all the issues that come before you. It upsets me no end to see my wonderful granddaughters discriminated against because they're girls. I just, I find it, <laughs> Very difficult, very difficult. <clears throat> and when sometimes my friends in particularly Korea will commiserate with me because I don't have a grandson. And it makes me furious because I, I say to them, I have two wonderful granddaughters, congratulate me. You should be so lucky. If I had a grandson, I would say the same thing. 
but I, I, I think that our, our attitudes and the way in which we treat people is, it is so difficult not to put down people, not to shame them, not to make them feel weak, unwanted. So whenever I'm around my granddaughters, I try to prepare myself. I try to prepare myself to accept them as they are. To praise them, yes. To give them my full support, yes. But to not do it because they're weak. Not do it because they're girls. They just are. And that's enough for me. Thank you, Lou. Uh, we got a more, a more question, but uh, because of the time limit, so I will just ask one last question. Yes. Uh, people who give but want to be recognized for the action, is that okay within the context of Buddhism? Or are we supposed to give without wanting some recognition? It's it's a hard it's a really hard question and I understand exactly what the question is. If a person needs the recognition, I say give it to them. I remember when, when the University of the West was purchased and the, the campus had once been a Christian school and it had buildings that were named for the people who gave the buildings when it was a Christian place. So some people said to Master Xingyun, shouldn't we take these names off these buildings after all? This is not a Christian place anymore. This is a Buddhist place. And he said, no, no, leave those names up there. Those people made a gift and it was important to them. And we shouldn't take it away from them. So if, if there are times when you have to say, if somebody really seems to need something, can without shame or blame or hesitation, if I can give it to them, can I just do it? Yes, put your name on a building. Sure, why not? Thank you. It's okay. And if ever in your life, you want to take your name off the building, that would be all right too. So I don't ever think that when we, we look and say, people don't do it right. They don't give in the right way. They want their name put up there. They want recognition. We're wrong to say that that's, 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 that's a bad way. That's why I want us to come to a place where we're, we are really sensitive to what people need. 
And if we can give the gift, we'll be the receivers. We will. If you can make somebody feel good about themselves or whatever that takes, I can guarantee you, you're going to get an enormous amount from it. There's nothing that's more wonderful than saying something to a child and that child beams. That's the most wonderful moments in life. I have a little five-year-old neighbor, and he loves to shout to me as I walk by every day on my walk. And he knows my name, so he says, hi, Lou, and we wave. Today he came out, and he was holding his mouth in a funny way, and, and I asked him, what's going on? And he, he pointed to a gap in his teeth. He had lost his first tooth and he wanted to share that with me. And he wanted to be recognized as having grown up and lost his first tooth. So I tried to give that to him and admire the gap in his teeth and ask about what he thought the tooth fairy was gonna leave under his pillow. And we had a wonderful conversation. And I tell you, it gave me a lot. When he smiled with that tooth gone at me, that made my day. That's giving and being the receiver at the same time, I think. Well, thank you. Uh, once again, thank you, Lou, for a wonderful talk. Uh, we look forward to having you also on Tuesday, ma uh, March 16 at 6 p.m. The topic of next le lecture is concentration, the strength of giving focus. And I'm also happy to announce that Venerable Thanissa Rabhiku, the abbot of the Meta Forest Monastery, San Diego, will be giving a lecture titled the Buddha's skill in questions on March 4 at 3 p.m. So that we will send you Zoom link and post on our pages, website. I hope you all can join. And at last, I would like to thank President Ta, Dr. Zain Ibn Mura, Dr. Sozan Ko, Christopher Johnson, Venable Dee, Venable Srinan, and Fong Sam for their support and encouragement. And thank you everybody uh, for attending. Stay safe and have a good night. Thank night, you. Lancaster. Bye bye. Good night. See you good next night. time. Professor Lancaster. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster. <laughs>